unit enchantments, minor race transformations, major transformations. There are just so many ways to manipulate and buff up the factions that you create for yourself in Age of Wonders 4. If you see my beginner's guide, a lot of people had some questions about how they work as well as some additional bits of information that I hope to answer for you in this video. If you're a veteran of the game and have a good chunk of hours in it though, you probably won't find anything new here and I don't want to waste your time. But for those that are struggling understanding certain things, I'll break things down per each of the aforementioned persistent buffs to your faction. And you can quickly navigate to any part of the video that interests you the most using the chapters in both the timeline and the description. Also, if you've not yet picked up the game, you can use my link to my Nexus store. Nexus is going to give you a Steam key directly from the developer, and it is a great way to support the channel as well as my mini Aussie's vicious treat habit. Lastly, don't forget to follow me on Twitch where I'll be streaming this game as well as just plenty of others. Let's get started here on explaining race transformations in Age of Wonders 4. So to start us off, let's talk about some general information just to kind of get this going. And if you booted this video up thinking I was going to go through every single race transformation, nay, ye be wrong. And the easiest way to do that, though, is just within the game. You go over here to the eye in the upper right corner, go to the encyclopedia, press on this little helmet, and just click any faction. Let's say you are playing as a dark culture and everyone are everyone is orcs, um, a dark warrior. And then you can just press this button right here, and it shows you all of the major the minor, and then the unit enchantments. You can just go through this and click on all the ones that you want to get an idea of what things happen. This way, you know, you're not trying to sift through the video to find out the exact one you want. You can just go and turn it on for yourself to get an idea of what it looks like. Now, of course, this is going to not be entirely unique. I mean, this is just a generic looking orc. It's not going to follow the exact maybe uh, skin colors or hair that you chose for your orc, but a lot of those things are going to go away anyway with your enchantments, your major and your minor race transformations. Now, it, I will talk about this in its respective section, but one important thing I did want to talk about before we jump into everything are how major race transformations apply to your faction. So, when you press, when you press transform, the entire race that you have selected right here is going to be turned into whatever that major race transformation is. Now, this will apply for all three of our categories we're going to talk about and even some of the other stuff. But you, from a drop-down menu, will be able to select any integrated faction that you have to apply race transformations to. Take, for example, I'm playing my vampire kin. Let's say we... Can I even see what these guys are? Let's say we brought in the cursed toadlings into our faction. Then in this drop down menu, that option would appear. So don't apply any minor, major, or unit enchantments to your army thinking it's going to apply to any integrated city that is a different race than your own. So if you're wondering why, why the hell is this not applying to them, you have to recast the spell and then go into it and take a look at making sure you apply it to the proper race or faction. And another really important distinction to make is applying that to your hero or not. If you are playing a champion, this checkbox will not be present. If you are playing a wizard king, you can choose to apply this to your character or not. So, in the example of Whiteborn, I'm, it is not checked, so when I press transform, my entire faction turns into whites, undead whites. But I will retain whatever existing stuff I have, for the exception, of course, of Whiteborn. Those are very important things I wanted to talk about because they are rules for every single thing we're going to talk about. And lastly is, of course, wherever you do this, you're going to find out, you're going to find them in this section here. Um, so whenever you turn on any of these enchantments or any of these, these race transformations, I think... Uh, those are all unit enchantments. Um, yeah, all this is unit enchantments, unfortunately. But any race transformations or any unit enchantments, you're going to find in this active section in your spells. You press this little guy, go to active, you're going to see here. And if the target is a different race, it's going to say target and then that race there for you. So just keep these things in mind. If you can't find one or you're just unsure of which ones are active, it's all going to be in this section. So um, while I might rehash this information in the other sections, it's just one I wanted to have on its own before we jump into our first one, unit enchantments. So opening up our conversation about unit enchantments, it's worth talking about a lot of things here. <laughs> so I'm going to look at lightning blades, and we're going to hover over unit enchantments. So it says here that it affects both existing and newly created units. Of course, it's it'll uh, be retroactive. Increase the upkeep of affected units, because we know that it will apply that as a mana cost 
per turn and can be canceled any time by the caster. We know that to be true. If you did not know that, you now know, you now do know that. And what you're going to see with unit enchantments is something very important: is that it affects a type of unit. So lightning blades, for example, here is going to affect our shock shield polearm, fighter, and skirmisher units. And it's just going to be listed right there. It can even give me a little parenthetical notation of which exact units are affixed by this, which is very nice to see. It's going to be able to uh, use this here. So all of these units are going to benefit from it. Also, too, whenever you research a tome that typically has a unit enchantment like something like this with lightning blades, you'll see that that becomes a different hero skill that you can then apply that exact enchantment for the most part to that hero. You'll notice, too, that this says lightning weapons, base, melee, and physical range attacks get four lightning minus two physical damage. But lightning focus applies only to magic attacks. So if you're playing a magic character and you use lightning weapons, it's not going to give them that benefit. So keep those things in mind. Make sure you do read base melee and physical ranged. Um, I think if we go here into, where is it? There's one for, well, spell amplification. Makes tactical spells deal. No, that's not it. That's not it. There's one that's going to do more damage basically to, for your magic attacks. Well, there you go. Uh, that's not it either. <laughs> that's a great video I've got going on right here. But so, uh, Grand's Magic Attacks, a 100% crit chance. There it is. So if you're using melee skills, it's not going to apply to that. So make sure you read the hero skills and make sure that they actually apply to you. One thing, though, to note with these unit enchantments is there's another set of unit enchantments that you're not going to get through tomes. You get through a special culture tome. So go ahead and press your into your Empire Development. You've got your cool tree. You've got this thing that shows you all the tomes that you've researched thus far. But if you go to the very bottom, you'll see some things. You have your general research tomes that are going to give you your Enchanted Crow Companion and your Wayfinder Enchantment. Everyone gets this. But you also have your Dark Tome. And this is important because it's going to give you certain things for being the Dark Culture. Now, this is, of course, different if you're playing Barbarians, if you're playing Feudal, whatever it is. But mainly in here, you want to look for there is always some sort of unit enchantment that gives the same unit enchantment that the Culture has. So... Let it here. Brand of Wrath. So as a unique thing of a dark unit, a dark culture unit, they have Call the Weak. Well, this adds Call the Weak to non-dark units. So while you might be using the normal unit enchantments that you get from Tomes, do keep in mind that you will have a special unit enchantment, which brings that ability from your culture to spread to other factions that you integrate that are not of your culture, allowing you to really kind of stack up a lot of really cool benefits onto your units with a lot of cool results. And of course, too, like I said, all of these things are going to be found anytime you jump into a tome. And you'll see that a unit enchantment has this little outline around it. These three stars like that. Um, little short uh, stars, three triangles. Versus this one has these really jagged ones. That's an enemy army spell. This is something that you're going to cast on the world map. So kind of look at that for a visual context clue. And of course, you can have any number of unit enchantments active in the game as long as you can pay the upkeep for them. And we've already talked about it, but just to kind of beat off a dead horse, uh, you go here and to take a look at what that unit enchantment, what that upkeep is going to cost. Even before you cast it, it should tell you, unfortunately, like this will tell me here um, what the casting cost is going to be, and it'll tell me exactly how much it's going to actually pull from me once it goes into here. Um, you, major race transformations don't have that, but if you hover over a actual um, enchantment, it'll tell you exactly upkeep per unit and the total upkeep will be highlighted right here for you can see okay this is pulling 24 mana away from me per turn with a two upkeep per unit you know what i really don't need all those skeletons or made that one skeleton that one pikeman i'm going to remove those and it's going to free up four mana for me so this is how you break down the granular kind of budgetary more or less of what that active cost is for your unit enchantments before we get into the minor and major race transformation, I want to talk about some other persistent spells you probably didn't realize exist. Now, Covenant of the Faith in Tome of the Beacon is a really good example here. You can see that this is a city spell. Units recruited through Rally of Legions from the Target Vassal have Faithful, which is really nice to reduce that upkeep, and Target Vassal City grants 10 Imperium each turn. This is really, really awesome. But there are two types of city spells. One that just simply is a city spell. You pay the cost and you're done. Then there's Sustained City Spell. Make sure you're looking at that before you cast it to get an idea of what it's going to cost you. So this 
the effect lasts as long as you pay mana each turn. Just like a unit enchantment, you're buffing up that specific vassal city to give you some benefits, and you'll pay for that as long as you have the spell active. Now, if I were to go over here to the Tome of Affinity, or I'm sorry, Materium Affinity, and go to Awaken Tools, this is just a city spell. You cast it, and it's done. You get 20 production, 20 draft, 10 stability. There you go. And it is out of the way. So look at some of those things because they are persistent and sometimes not persistent. So you do want to make sure you're doing the right thing there, right? Transmute resources is a sustained city spell. Target from the new city converts their mana income, gaining gold, production, food, income equal to 75% of their mana income. And of course, pay for it every turn. Now, there are other things too that you want to take a look at. And I really want you to focus on them because they, not focus on them, but just know that they exist. Um, Shadow Affinity's got a good one here. It's cold dark. So Flash Freeze is a terraforming spell. It's another one and done. You're paying for the cost. It simply uh, changes that actual tile into an Arctic terrain and you're done. That's it. Um, same thing here too with Marching Winter, which is a terraforming spell. The target friendly city starts altering terrain to Arctic at two provinces per turn. The spell extends to two provinces as of the domain. While this spell is active, uh, provinces with snow and ice provide two food and two production. So this is going to do this per turn. And it says changes the climate of one, multi of, of one or multiple provinces and cast mana. But it does not have a persistent cost. So just know those things going into them that some things will have persistent costs and it will simply just outline it in the tool tip if you're not sure. So simply hover over it and it'll tell you exactly um, what it's gonna, well, it'll, it'll tell you that it will cost a sustained amount of mana. But those are some of the other persistent spells that you might not have knew have existed before we jump into our race transformations. And Tome of Vigor is a really good place to start when we talk about minor race transformations because super growth is a really cool evident one. And this one, what it's going to be doing is it's going to reduce the number of models in a unit formation and make them much larger. So they're gonna do more damage, uh, we're gonna have more hit points, they're gonna plus one retaliation attack, and they're gonna do more damage by virtue of decreased number of units in formation, meaning it takes longer, more health for them to lose before they lose a unit in a formation, which would then reduce their damage. Uh, that kind of got convoluted there, but either way, this is a minor race transformation. And like I said, you're going to ca cast these minor race transformations in the same way you would any other unit enchantment. You're going to ready the spell and you're going to cast it and you would apply it to a set race. Now you can apply it to your own race because you are assumed the keeper of that race. And that is a very important thing. So here is a race's keeper. The race keeper is the ruler whose empire has the biggest presence of a race through own cities and vassals. You are always the keeper of the race you start with. To become the keeper of a race, you have to have 40% of the race's population in your empire. If the race already has a race keeper, you need five pop more than them to take it from them. So how that all works. I am the vampire kin, so I will always be the keeper of the vampire kin. But take, for example, here, the cursed toadlings once more. Uh, well, Reyna is the keeper of the Cursed Toadlings, and I would need to, if she has 20 population of Cursed Toadlings, I would need to somehow get 25. And mo moreover, if she exists, I think that actually messes with who can be the keeper of them, because there's very few vassals in the game that are going to be <laughs> the, the uh, Cursed Toadlings. Usually there's one other vassal out there that matches the race of who you've created, maybe, maybe another one. So you need to actually kill her and then start inducting the race to becomes their keeper. And once you become their keeper, you can apply these race transformations. And outside of that though too, you're going to deal with certain things that are going to appear for you as the keeper. To become the keeper of another player starting race, the player would have to be defeated first. There you go, that answered my question. But the race keeper is the only ruler who can apply major and minor race transformations. And outside of that, you're going to be dealt with dilemmas that add traits to that race as their keeper it'll say hey you know what being under your rule they've maybe devised the fact that they want to be more evil or something like that so you'll be actually delivered a dilemma that'll ask you do you want to encourage that giving more stability to that race or do you want to discourage it and it won't actually apply that trait and they'll be pissed off at you so being the keeper isn't just simply about minor and major race transformations it's also about little traits that are going to apply that at race over time as you're their keeper so outside of that though you are also going to know that minor race transformations 
are not limited. Whenever we cast a major race transformation, it is limited, right? And a miter race transformation is not. And it's an important thing to note about both race transformations as you are not paying an upkeep on them. So take a look at Joy Siphoner's minor race transformation. Uh, it does not say that this will cost you per turn, right? And we've taken a look already at this, but we'll bring it up once more. Um, active, we can see that the, the that they are not is not in this in this list. Only unit enchantments will be in here. Um, I kind of misspoke a little bit earlier uh, in that section because I got it kind of fumbled up in my brain. But if I go ahead and right click on any of my vampire kin, I see Joy Siphoners right here. So the only way to actually see those is if you actually look at the unit itself, or if you check your tone to see if you've researched it. So those are how the minor race transformations work. The big key things here, of course, being that you have to be a keeper of the race, and there is no limit on your minor race transformations. Let's pivot now onto our major ones. So we're gonna go back to talking about Whiteborn and major race transformations are at a limit, right? A race can only have one major race transformation. And again, you must be the keeper. We talked about how that works before in the, major, in the minor um, race transformation section. You can jump back a little bit to find that out if you missed it. But we're gonna go ahead and research the spell. We have to prime the spell like you do always, right? You have to ready it up. Then you're gonna go ahead and click it, and here you go. Again, just like for minor race transformations, you're gonna apply it to the race you wanna do and then choose if you wanna apply it to yourself or not. I am not going to apply it to myself in this instance, and I'm going to press transform. So my race will now become whiteborn. And as you can see, it is a terrifying change to the way that they look. Um, but they become undead, which is awesome. And they also have lifesteal, which kind of furthers the role of the vampire kin. So it kind of fits the overall kind of image I had in mind for this faction, despite the fact that vampires aren't whites, but that's neither here nor there. And it changes everything about them, right? That changes a little icon here. If I go over to it, I can see right here and I'm good to go. But I no longer can use another major race transformation. So if I go to nature, uh, it's, Nature's Wrath? No, no, it's Paradise. Gaia's Chosen. If I were to research this, I cannot cast it on my race. I can only have one active. So it would replace my Whiteborn in that instance. But I can cast this on another race that I decide to integrate into my faction. So don't think that if you have Whiteborn active, you'll never be able to use, say, Demonkin or Angel Eyes or Gaia's Chosen. You can still apply that to another faction or just overwrite and change uh, your, your uh, set major race transformation. So that is the breakdown on how the transformations, unit enchantments, and persistent spells work in Age of Wonders 4. A lot of this, I think, might be a little self-explanatory, but there might be a little bit of muddiness somewhere in the explanation of some of these, especially the keeper note. I don't think the game really does a good job of explaining what or how important a keeper is as you integrate more factions into your empire as you go through each and one of your games. But hopefully this now gives you a better idea of maybe you wanted to do a major race transformation and you didn't know that you could just swap to another one. It'll remove it, but you can swap to another one because it says only one at a time. So you just simply, again, research it, move to it, and then there you go. Or maybe you didn't know that you could actually turn off the ability for a major race transformation to apply to you if you are a wizard king. Because remember, as a wizard king, you've come from an external source to tyrannically rule over a faction versus a champion is raised up from that faction. Now, I wish or hope that in a patch or at least a mod in the future, we can choose to apply the aesthetics of a um, major race transformation while not applying the um, effect or other way around. Sorry. So if I want to put Whiteborn to turn my vampire hero into the undead, I would like to do that, but maybe without applying the aesthetic. And the same thing, too, with the faction as well. Although I would argue that's kind of part of it, right? Like making them demons or angels is a really cool part of it. Whiteborn just is kind of a little funky because it makes everyone just bald like me, which sucks. Um, but there you go, guys. If you have any questions on any of these spells, or maybe you've noticed a little thing in here that I maybe explained wrong, go ahead and let me know in the comment section below. Always happy to spread as much information as I can. But as always, thank you so much for watching here today. Have a good one and take care.